Good evening, and thank you for tuning in for our midweek connection point. My desire this evening is to briefly give you a sense of normalcy in your time of quarantine, isolation of the coronavirus, um, have a short devotion, uh, maybe a word from our music leader, and uh, I've got a special announcement for you as well. So first of all, I want to thank you all for tuning in, but I also want to thank you, uh, those of you who watched our live stream service Sunday morning. A lot of work went into that, not from me necessarily, but from uh, Ezra Baker specifically, and then your worship team. So thank you for watching that. Those of you who shared it, those of you who reflected upon it and read your pastoral letter, uh, I'm very encouraged by our response and how many people we were able to reach, um, hopefully with uh, emphasis on the gospel. So first thing tonight, announcements, some that you um, maybe already know about this Sunday morning, again, we'll be live streaming and hope to have a special testimony time from someone from their home uh, about how they came to saving faith in Christ, uh, what the gospel is, and how they are still trusting in Christ even more this day. Um, and then this Sunday morning, um, we'll be reviewing and singing our family worship song, the Psalm 145. I hope you found the link. Um, if you haven't already, you can go back to one of the previous posts on Facebook and click there to listen to that song and practice singing it so you know it, to sing it with your family, even to learn it. Hope you to give you uh, the chords so you can learn to play it on the piano or the guitar if you're so musically talented. But again, we'll be singing that this Sunday morning. And then since we finished Habakkuk um, in the Old Testament, we'll be switching to the New Testament this Sunday morning in beginning a four-chapter series on the book of Romans. Romans is my favorite book of the Bible, period. So I'm excited to begin that adventure. And so one way you can prepare your hearts, if you're not familiar with the book, or to just get somewhere in Scripture and be with your children or your spouse or by yourself in the Word this week, why don't you take some time to read Romans chapter 1? It's just 20 or so verses to begin to prepare you to think the way that Paul is going to ask us to think and see where his arguments are going in defense of the gospel, a gospel that is timeless and eternal and the best, uh, best message in the best letter ever written. So um, those are some basic announcements. And then the special announcement I have for you is this. In lieu of the coronavirus and being separated and exiled, it's been very difficult for us to share prayer requests and updates about what's going on in our lives. Our lives are going on, though, differently. Uh, there are prayer needs, uh, prayer concerns, prayer praises, evangelism requests, uh, and things of that nature. So several of you have wisely suggested that we finally use this as a reason for this pastor to get a prayer chain or an email chain together so that we can stay in contact with each other throughout the week. So I've been working on an app um, and making our prayer directory for those who are members of Bethany Baptist Church a, um, a virtual resource that you can have in your pocket or on your computer at all times so you know who to be praying for. But also it'll have the contact information, address, phone number, and email. So hopefully by now you've been contacted um, either by Sue Evans or myself, don't be surprised if she calls you, asking for your email if you're a member at Bethany Baptist Church, your email address. The purpose of this is so that we can have one way to email out prayer concerns as they come out or family worship instructions or announcements like this one that we're having a devotion to all of our members swiftly and systematically. So I hope you'll answer Sue or myself and text or write back and give your email address. I'm going to insert that into a very safe database. It's called Instant Church. It's an Instant Church directory. It's an app that we have subscribed to um, safely to shepherd um, the sheep of our flock and keep us connected, especially in this time. So once you've got your email address or your cell phone, like you had last week, maybe you'll receive a message telling you, when we're meeting again, an update um, on things that are going on in our church and specifically prayer requests. So I hope you're excited about that. I'm excited about it. That makes my job easier and makes your connectedness to the body um, so much better. So then moving forward, once you start seeing those emails come through and I get that app in people's hands who want to use it, 
If you have any prayer requests um, that you want prayed for throughout our congregation, whether that be for members or for friends of our church or people that maybe no one else knows, a missionary that you're supporting, and you want the church at Bethany to be praying about that, all you have to do is text or email myself or Sue Evans. Um, I'll be posting the information you need to do that um, specifically, hopefully, in the future. But that is a resource we're making available to you to connect us in this time of exile from one another. So that concludes our time of um, announcements. Now I'm going to share with you a brief video I uh, made earlier with Jordan Begley, your worship minister, music leader, um, about family worship and the song that he introduced to us um, last week. All right, now I am with Jordan Begley at his house. We are sitting one chair or approximately six feet apart for our safety, our family's safety, and to be a good example to you law-abiding citizens and Christians. So I've come to Jordan's house with a couple of questions for him as our music uh, leader, worship leader, and just as a brother in Christ, um, trying to put some of these things we've been talking about into practice. So I'm going to show you Jordan, and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions um, while you uh, listen to him. Hey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jordan Begley, you picked uh, Psalm 145 um, for our family worship as a church, specifically this month. Why did you pick this song that you taught us? Um, so general answer to um, begin, I guess, is why are we seeing new songs? Uh, I thought I might address that. Um, there will always be a place for seeing rich, time-tested songs of the faith that have um, lasted for centuries. Uh, but I think I've become more and more convinced uh, through Scripture where it says, sing unto the Lord a new song. And when you read that psalm, uh, it's not saying sing about new things, but sing about the same truths that you've known for a long time, but sing them in a new, fresh way. Um, so I know I can attest that in my own soul, of even taking the same lyrics I've sang 4,000 times, but singing them to a new uh, melody or something how that just changes uh, things makes me my soul think about the lyrics differently so that would be uh, in general why we're kind of learning new songs um, Psalm 145 specifically um, one was in obedience to Colossians the text in Colossians when we, we were there a while back where we are to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And the way we, one way we can do that is by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So I personally felt uh, I've not done that since, that I've not sung psalms much. And maybe uh, churches I've been part of in general. So that's, I think that's a way we can sit under the text and take what God has said to us and and do it. So I've specifically looked for psalms more often than not when we're learning new songs. Um, what is so safe about singing a psalm is you don't have to think uh, are we singing what is true about God, about uh, anything. Whereas any other song that you just pick up here in the radio you should always be questioning it. Is this portraying God accurately? Is this true from what Scripture says? This We're singing Psalm 145. It is true. We know this is saying what is true about God, what it says about us. Um, and then I usually, what is one of the more difficult things actually, and this is just kind of insight into what I'm thinking most weeks, is... Uh, singing as a congregation is most important not um, if I'm saying this clearly it's not most is not uh, the most important thing that the song is really catchy or 
that it sounds really cool. What's most important about a song is that we can all sing it together as a congregation, as a body. So finding songs that you that can be sung well together and learn fairly easily is kind of difficult. So I thought this one was singable, easy to learn, where we can pick it up uh, quickly together. Um, and I think that's it. All right, uh, Jordan, why don't you tell us about just family worship in general? So why? do the Begley's choose to do that at home? Um, first and foremost, I think I'm convinced that God has commanded it, that the primary place for discipleship, for teaching and learning is not in uh, when we're all gathered together on Sunday, although that definitely happens in given in Scripture, uh, but in Deuteronomy 6, when you read the text, it is assuming that it is speaking to leaders of households, that you to teach diligently to your children, to your family, to those under you. That's where it doesn't say teach diligently in the temple or when you're all gathered as a community together. So God is going to hold me first and foremost responsible for my children, for my family. Uh, so that that's the why, because I believe God has commanded it. All right. That's good, brother. And then a uh, final question. Um, speaking of the act of family worship, tell us a little bit about singing. So it's January, February, March, April. This is our fourth family worship song that we've tried to been singing as a church. Um, fourth song you've taught your children and I assume singing with them. Tell us about um, just singing in the Begley household and how singing has been a blessing to family worship here. Um, we're, we're learning you should not have in your mind that uh, we're this great uh, singing performance happens. Sometimes it's really ugly, and we're just working through a song. And we, anyways, but it has been even through the struggles and figuring it out. It has been a great blessing. You probably noticed God has so wired us that a truth that you can't get a verse or two that you cannot get to stick in your mind as many times as you try to memorize it or think about it um, you put it to music and all of a sudden you have it forever and you don't even have to try to memorize it so in that way it has been a great blessing to my soul first uh, like many of you probably uh, over the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God you can you can fill in the blank after that where it's stuck so it is an easy way God has made us for truth to stick in us so seeing that in myself has been helpful it's helped me memorize um, those Psalm 23 again and those others um, and then in my children uh, hearing them um, pick up songs and be able to sing them together uh, God has commanded us to sing it's actually a command that we are to sing to the Lord um, so try to take that more serious and to see my whole family together singing and um, worshiping together as a family has been a huge blessing uh, Jordan why don't you tell us briefly when you guys typically do family worship uh, best case scenario and what it looks like beginning to end for the Begley's um, something has changed almost constantly for a long time and probably even in the last I don't know six eight months has it gotten a little bit more solidified and regular I feel like God's still growing us in it and what works and what doesn't work um, 
so I expect it always to be changing in some way, a way to get better. Um, so right now, it's usually around the dinner table, a set place that we're always at, uh, most nights, always at, especially in quarantine, you're always at in the evenings. Um, so after dinner, uh, we will read the New Testament reading in our Bible reading plan. So right now we're in Luke. We read Luke 10 tonight. Um, so we'll read, uh, try to ask the kids questions as much as I can. And uh, What's so helpful is try to take a handful of verses and try to explain it to a three-year-old or a four-year-old. And you'll realize that you don't quite understand it as good as you thought you did. But in that struggle, uh, you're like, wow, uh, it's helpful. Anyways, so we'll read the text, and then uh, then we will get our direct church directory out and pray through a family in our church and usually let, let the... Bible reading from that day kind of instruct how we pray for uh, tonight we prayed for the Stone family, Travis and Tiffany and their kids so um, we prayed in Luke 10 it said about uh, the disciples were just so happy because they were able to cast out demons and do all this great works but Jesus said that they should be most happy that their names were written in the Lamb, written down in heaven so we were praying for Travis and Tiffany's joy, just that they were gods, not in any work they are doing or can do, but just praying for them to rest in the gospel, to um, be most happy about that. Uh, so then we, that, that's what we'll end. Um, and usually, well, it's hit or miss, but we usually sing before we eat. Noah is starting to learn the piano, so sometimes she'll help us by playing the piano, but we'll sing. Most of the time it's our the family worship song uh, for the month. Um, uh, and then sometimes we mix in other easy songs, God is so good, and things like that. All right, I hope you enjoyed that brief um, time with Jordan Begley about worship. We have a great worship minister. I'm very thankful for him. And not just as my friend, but as uh, a spiritual leader uh, to me and, and in our lives as a church. So I want to take just maybe five to ten minutes to give you a connection point in God's Word. I don't have a whole sermon like we've been going through the book of Exodus, but I just want to share something that came from my own quiet time out of the overflow of my time alone with God. I hope you guys are doing that daily in His Word. If you need a, a reading plan, I'd be happy to email you one that several folks at church are doing. It's about three chapters in the Old Testament. We just began First Kings and then about half a chapter in the New Testament. We are in the Gospel of Luke. But this came a couple of um, mornings ago as I was reading through the end of Second Samuel. Uh, I'll read you the scripture and then I'll give you a brief summary of what's going on and then a couple of points I think that, that apply to all of us in some way right now. This is from Second Samuel. It's in your Old Testament if you're following along with your family or by yourself. 2 Samuel chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 1 through um, 8 or so. It says this, It was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard that day, the king is grieving for his son. And the people stole into the city that day as people still in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. The king covered his face and the king crowd, cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Verse 5. It says, Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, You have today covered with shame the faces of all your servants who have this day saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines because you love those who hate you and hate those who love you 
For you have made it clear today that commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go, not a man will stay with you this night. And this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. Verse 8 says, And the king arose and took his seat in the gate, and the people were all told, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate. And all the people came before the king. So many of you probably aren't familiar with the, the bigger story that's going on here in this narrative uh, historical text about King David in First and Second Samuel. So let me just briefly let you know what's going on, and then I'll give you your points of application. So David has become the king of Israel. He's the best king, humanly speaking, to um, lead God's people. And, um, well, David had many sons, but one of them in particular, his name was Absalom. Now, Absalom, the Bible makes clear, was a wicked son, a wicked, wicked son. I can't even share with you over the internet the kinds of things he did in rebellion that brought shame to his uh, his father's name into the to the name of the God of Israel. He was just he was just wicked. He was absolute rebel. Now I said I can tell you about in his rebellion is that he did this. He divided David's people against him. That is, so people were following David. He's a good king. He's leading his people well. And Absalom the son grows to be old enough. He's in his youth and strength. And he tries to steal the hearts of the people from David, God's rightful king, his anointed one. Absalom was wicked. Absalom was selfish. Absalom was a son who wasn't disciplined and was just rebellious. He, he was a wicked, wicked son. I can't say that enough. And so what, what, what happened over time is Absalom tried to divide the people from David, or from God, I should say, and David formed his army. The armies of David, good army, and the armies of Absalom, bad army in the story of First and Second Samuel, they began to wage war for the allegiance of the people for the rightful kingship of God's nation in the Old Testament, Israel. And so what happens right here before this chapter is that the, the, the battle is going to be coming to an end soon. And so David gives this command to his servants who love him, who are loyal to God and to him. And they say, he says, when the battle happens, whatever you do, even if we win and we're going to win, do not kill my son. Now, when we hear that, we would say, well, who wants their son to die? And I think that's a, a rightful desire. David, even though his son has become his enemy and uh, has been rebellious, just like any parent you wouldn't want your child to die. You wouldn't want necessarily life-ending harm to come upon them. But here's what happens. In the midst of the battle, Absalom dies, and some of uh, David's servants uh, finish him off. They, they kill him, and they bring this news back to David. The big news is that we've won. The kingdom is rightfully yours, David. You can rest from your enemies. You can have your throne back. God has delivered you from your enemies. But the piece of news, the only piece of news that David was listening for was, well, what happened to my son? He concentrated on this one person. And so the news came back that Absalom, your son, is dead. And here's where we see one of the few sins we have written in Scripture that King David, a man after God's heart, committed. It says that in the story that David was so, so, so upset for the death of his son. He was too upset. He was so upset that his wicked, rebellious son had died that he couldn't celebrate all of the good that was going on. He focused on whether one person was alive or whether one person was still with him rather than the multitudes and the thousands that God had rightfully given to follow David. Those who supported him, who loved him, who had risked their lives and reputations to protect David. And so David's mourning and David, King David, a man after God's own heart, gets a rebuke from one of his faithful servants. 
It's Joab. He does this in verse 5. He rebukes him for the way that he's mourned over this one bad apple instead of celebrating all the good things that have happened. He says in verse 6, Because you love those who hate you and hate those who love you, you have made it clear today that the commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead, oh, here it comes, then you would be pleased. So Joab comes and he says, David, there's a place for mourning. You should mourn over anyone that dies, but you can't let your mourning ruin your whole day, your whole life, based on this one thing that has happened, this one person who was a wicked person, and reject all these good things that have happened to you. So two sides of application I want to make for us as a church today. The, the first is this. Perhaps you're a David right now in this season of life and you are mourning over things that are legitimately sad. Some news you've received, some setback you have, maybe someone you love has died, um, whatever. Maybe a friend has betrayed you. And it is, it's okay to mourn. We, we expect David to mourn, but it seems like this mourning has gone beyond sanity or trust in God or a celebration of the good things that have happened. And so I want you to hear the rebuke of Joab. Friend, I want you to lift your eyes off, off of a few bad things that have happened and look at all the good going on around you. Joab says you have hundreds of servants and men and women that have been rescued, good things that are going on, and all you can focus in on is the bad. Now, David was an emotional person, but he was a little bit self-centered in this. He was a little bit given to melancholy. So I want you to hear the rebuke to, to think about the good things that are still going on in the midst of the coronavirus or even just this week. Or if you can't think of anything good that's happened this week, I want you to step back. As one of my favorite preachers, Mark Dever, says, if the view you have of life right now is discouraging and depressing, all he says is to zoom your camera out further and further in your life in history, in world history, in the plan of redemption, till you see good that God has done. Surely, surely there is good. And meditate on that and change your countenance and say your thankfulness and praise God for those good things, maybe in the midst of a storm. So that's my encouragement um, to you, Davids. I can be a David. I read this story and it meant a lot to me last week because I was being a David. I thought about one bad thing, one person that had offended me and that I loved but was was hurting me and I was missing all of the people who were encouraging me and the good things that are going on in my family and in our church. People being reached for the gospel. People growing in the word. People calling one another. Uh, people uh, visiting each other from their porches and encouraging um, willing to serve, asking what can we do to serve Bethany Baptist Church. All these good things going on, and yet sometimes I can be a David and focus on one or two bad apples or bad things. Okay, second, second form of application here. Perhaps you're not a David. Perhaps you're a Joab. Like, you're the person that right now, you're feeling, you're encouraged. You see the good. Uh, or maybe you're just always that way. Maybe you're like Nelson Hardcastle, like, you're just always happy. You always see the good side or you're given the gift of encouragement um, or you have a way with words or you just, you're just so in love with Christ. No matter what happens, you just, you're just full of joy. I want to be more like you. I want to be more like Habakkuk, rejoicing no matter what's going on outside. So if you're a Joab, or maybe if you're not a Joab, I'm calling you to become a Joab from looking at this text. I want you to do this. I want you to find a person in your life, a David, who you know is discouraged, who is focusing in on something sad too much so that it's just hurt them, hurt their family, hurt their walk with the Lord. And I want you to help them to zoom out, to see the big picture. I want you to lift up their eyes and to call to their attention the good things that are still going on. I want you to be a Joab. See, some of you might have read this and said, well, I'm not, I'm not given to depression. There's nothing sad going on in life. Okay, well, good. Then come help us Davids out. Call a David. Rebuke a David. Write a letter to a David and just call to their attention all of the good things that God is doing in their life. 
in this text, you're either a, a David um, or a Joab. And then a, a point of connection to think about Jesus. Maybe when you read the story, you're still hung up on the fact that I seem insensitive to tell David to stop crying about his son and to be okay with all of the friends and other things he has. One of the things that that Jesus said to the disciples, an exchange that happened in, in several of the Gospels, is this. Jesus is preaching in a house, and many, many people are coming to listen, and, and they're being fed, they're growing, they're repenting, they're believing, they're, they're becoming children of God, part of the family of God that comes through repenting of our sins and putting our faith in the person of Jesus. And it says that his his brothers and sisters, biologically speaking, and his mom are standing outside. They can't get in. And I think the disciples come to him and they say, Jesus, don't you know your, your mom and your brothers, your biological brothers and sisters, they can't get in. And Jesus did this thing that seems as strange as maybe what Joab said to you or to David in our text. He says, who are my mother and brother and sisters? And he points to not his biological family that can't get in, but to his spiritual family that is around him. Okay, Jesus said things like this. If you're not willing to come follow me, to give your life to come follow me at the expense of family and friends, you're not worthy of me. And yet he says, here is my true family. So, um, church family, I want to ask you, are you a part of the family of God? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? You have been, been born again through faith in Him according to the Spirit, according to His eternal gospel, and made a child of God so that you still love your biological family and you provide for them and you weep for them lest you be worse than an unbeliever but that your love for a greater kingdom, your love for Jesus, can cause you to follow Him, even if that means leaving biological family behind in some ways. Some ways. You see, in our story, Absalom was biologically David's child, but he was not a child of God. Absalom proved by his rejection of the anointed one. He proved by virtue that he was not the anointed son of David, but he was a rebel and he refused to repent and he continued in his sexual morality and rebellion up until the day of his death that though Absalom was biologically a child of David, he was not spiritually putting his faith in God. He was not a child of God, a born-again child of God. And so David should have grieved for Absalom, but he should have celebrated the family of God he had that is eternal, who though they die will live again, who have Christ's righteousness given to them because of Christ's death and resurrection. So just think about that as we think about biological family and spiritual family, as we think about what we should weep over, what we should grieve, and what we keep our focus on. So thank you for joining us this evening. I hope to see you Sunday morning. I will be dressed up and wearing a jacket because it'll be Sunday morning, right? Recorded live for you with singing and a special testimony time. Um, so please feel free to share this and use it in your family worship. I love you, Bethany Baptist Church. I miss you. I am ready for this coronavirus to be over so we can be reunited. Real quick before we go, how about we end uh, with singing? Jordan is going to lead us from his home um, on the piano, on the keyboard, uh, through a song I hope all of you know. I hope you can sing along uh, as we close our time together this evening. The song is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. I hope you enjoy. Mm -hmm.